Okay, welcome back to our lecture. Today we're going over the urinary system. My name is Matthew Belzer. This lecture is intended for introductory students at Austin Community College. Pardon me. So, as always, I've provided you with a set of learning objectives. Those will kind of help guide your thinking as you go through the lecture, thinking about what's important and what you need to know for the exam. I've also provided you with a lecture handout. My suggestion would be to either print that handout out so you can write in uh, notes by hand or have it up on a computer so you can type your notes as we move along. So learning objective number one, functions of the urinary slash renal system. I often use these interchangeably, renal system, anytime you see R-E-N in a word, it means pertaining to the kidneys. And because the kidneys form kind of the centerpiece of the urinary system, it's where a lot of the functionality of the urinary system derives from, I often use urinary system or renal system kind of interchangeably, just so you know. Now when you think about the functions of the urinary system, the urinary system influences every other system in the body. It has a wide array of functions. It's not just there to make urine and filter out toxins, right? It plays an important role in a lot of different processes. So let's talk about the five primary functions of the urinary system or the renal system that you need to know. One, it regulates the ionic composition of blood. So it regulates blood levels of ions, specifically ions like sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, magnesium, etc. Now, as we learned in our nervous system section and in our skeletal muscle system section, ions are really important with respect to different physiological processes like firing and action potential, which is how neurons right, communicate with each other or how skeletal muscle initiates contraction. So you need the, the concentration of these electrolytes or ions in the blood to be monitored very carefully, and the system that monitors and adjusts the electrolyte composition in our blood is the urinary system or the renal system, so that's a really important function. It regulates blood pH. It does that either by getting rid of hydrogen and absorbing bicarbonate or getting rid of bicarbonate and reabsorbing hydrogen. It regulates blood volume, meaning the actual amount of blood you have, so let's say that you got dehydrated and your blood volume went from 5 liters to 4.8 liters. What the urinary system would do is it would trigger the reabsorption of water and it would reduce the urinary output to try and bring that blood volume up. Blood volume is really important because it influences blood pressure. Whatever happens to blood volume will happen to blood pressure. So if we bring blood volume up, blood pressure will go up. If we take blood volume down, blood pressure will go down. In other words, right, the kidneys also play a really important role in regulating blood pressure through the regulation of blood volume. So if your blood pressure is too high, for example, the kidneys may get rid of blood volume in the form of urine because urine is just filtered blood plasma, right, to bring that blood volume down, to bring your blood pressure back into normal range. And then finally, right, the excretion or the filtration and excre excretion of metabolic waste and foreign substances. So the elimination of metabolic waste like urea, uric acid, ammonia, which is uh, the byproduct of the breakdown of things like nucleic acids and proteins, the elimination of exogenous toxic compounds like medications, that's all happening in the kidneys. So the kidneys and the urinary system serve a wide array of roles, and knowing those functions is important. On an exam, I would think about something like a multiple answer question for this particular learning objective. Now, the next learning objective is just knowing the organs of the urinary system. When you think about the urinary system, here we have our diaphragm and then locked against the posterior body cavity wall right around the region of the lumbar vertebrae in the lumbar region, right, you have your kidneys. And your kidneys set what, sit what's called retroperitoneally. So they actually rest behind the peritoneal cavity or posterior to the peritoneal cavity. They're not in the peritoneal cavity. And that's why we say they sit retroperitoneally. The kidneys are bean-shaped organs with the adrenal glands on top of them, and their job is to filter blood plasma. That's what the kidneys do. Filtered blood plasma that doesn't get reabsorbed eventually enters into the ureter, and at that point, it's no longer called filtered blood plasma or filtrate, which we're going to talk about in a minute. It's called urine. The ureters are muscular tubes that transport urine from the kidney to this muscular sac that sits in the pelvic cavity called the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder then holds that urine until it's ready to be excreted through the process of voiding or urination. 
right? And the tube that transmits that urine or transports that urine from the urinary bladder to the external environment is the urethra. So the four organs of the urinary system are the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra. Now, when you think about where the kidneys sit in the body, this idea of being retroperitoneal is important. So here we have a cross section of the body and we're looking from inferior to superior. So always kind of reference what it is you're actually looking at. If you'll notice the kidneys are asymmetrical, meaning that one typically rests lower than the other. And when we look at the kidneys within the body cavity, I want to highlight or emphasize again this idea of being retroperitoneal. So surrounding our, our uh, digestive organs, we have what's called the peritoneum, right? And remember the peritoneum has the visceral peritoneum and the parietal peritoneum and the peritoneal cavity. The kidneys don't exist in the peritoneal cavity. They exist what's called retroperitoneally. They are locked against the posterior body cavity wall. They don't sit in the peritoneal cavity. Now when we look at it, the kidneys are surrounded by a few different layers. So as we go through these layers from superficial to, or from uh, outside closer to the kidneys, the first layer that we look at is what's called the renal phasia, right? So it would be superficial to deep. So the renal phasia is just a network of connective tissue like all phasias are in the body that lock the kidneys into place. So they wrap around and lock the kidneys into place. And they work closely with this thing called the adipose capsule. The adipose capsule is just a layer of fat around the kidneys. And again, the renal phasia and the adipose capsule lock the kidneys into place. Now, people who are suffering psychiatric starvation, for example, that we call anorexia, tend to lose a significant percentage of their body fat. And when they lose that body fat, they can actually lose the fat in the adipose capsule that surrounds the kidneys. And the kidneys can pop out of place. It's called a floating kidney, so they can actually pop out of where they're supposed to be locked. And that can do things like kink up the ureter, produce a condition in which tox toxins start to build up in the blood, and it's called a floating kidney. So that adipose capsule is really, really important. Now, the outer wall of the kidney itself is made from dense connective tissue, and that dense connective tissue we call the renal capsule. So there are three layers surrounding the kidneys, and I just want you to kind of understand that renophagia and adipose capsule. Think about the idea of the floating kidney, and then the outside of the kidneys, because the internal components are soft, is surrounded by this dense connective tissue capsule that kind of stabilizes the internal components. Now, when we look at the anatomy of the kidney, there are a few different things that I want you to be aware of. First, if I said identify the structure indicated by the pointer, this outermost dense connective tissue structure that stabilizes the soft internal regions of the kidney is called the renal capsule. Now, the functional tissue of the kidney is split into two discrete regions. The outermost region, so this entire region here that stains a little bit lighter as a consequence of the type of tissue you find there, is called the renal cortex. So if I put a bracket around this region and I said identify the region, or which of the following would correctly identify the region indicated by the bracket, that would be the renal cortex. Within the renal cortex you have different structures, right? But I won't ask the structures as a region. So you have the renal cortex and then the deep region of the kidney that has a different set of structures that stains a little bit more darkly is referred to as the renal medulla. So you have the renal cortex and the renal medulla and within these different regions you find different structures. So these macroscopic structures, this kind of dark staining tissue that on this image looks kind of like a guitar pick but in reality looks like a pyramid, right? actually three-dimensionally like a pyramid, these structures, these macroscopic structures that you can see with the unaided eye are called renal pyramids. So identify the structure indicated by the pointer, structure, structure, structure. Those would all be renal pyramids. And you find renal pyramids within the renal medulla, right? Now, the lighter staining tissue in between each pyramid is called a renal column. The tip of the renal pyramids, which are really important for our discussion today, are referred to as renal papilla. 
And when you take a renal column, the renal medulla and the renal cortex, and you kind of slice it into a pizza shape like this, you form a larger functional region of the kidney called the renal lobe. Now, the most important structures in the kidney, what actually do the work that the kidney does, are microscopic structures. So they've just, the illustrators of this textbook have just drawn this structure big so you can see it. But these are microscopic structures that you need to look at under the microscope. And in each kidney, there's like a million of them or more. And these microscopic structures that do all the work of the kidney and that we're going to spend so much uh, time today focusing on, these structures are called nephrons. So if you go and see a nephrologist, for example, you're going to see a kidney specialist. And in fact, the kidney is so important and does so many things that nephrology is actually a thriving area in medicine. So you have the nephron. And the nephron, when we think back to the functions of the kidney, regulating ion composition, blood volume, blood pressure, that all takes place in the nephron. Now, the nephron interacts with a network of blood vessels that we're going to look at in just a little bit. But the fluid that flows through the nephron is called filtrate, right? Because it is the product of filtration at the capillaries that interact with the nephron. And that's what, in fact, the job of the kidneys is in many respects, is to filter blood plasma. And then in doing that, you get the processes that lead to urine formation. And you'll see how the other uh, functional roles of the kidney kind of tie in. The fluid that flows through the nephron, a.k.a. the renal tubule, is called filtrate. So that filtrate moves through the proximal convoluted tubule of the nephron to the descending loop of Henle, the ascending loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule to the collecting duct. When that fluid, that filtered blood plasma, is in the nephron, it is called filtrate because it's being, the chemical composition is being modified. Good stuff is being reabsorbed, bad stuff is being secreted or eliminated, right? So the composition of that filtrate is changing as it moves through the nephron. But when it gets done being in the nephron, when that filtrate has been modified and now we have the substance we want to physically get rid of through the process of urination, it drains into this collection system, and the initial part of the collection system that picks up the fluid leaving the nephron is called the minor calyx. The moment that fluid flows from the nephron into the minor calyx, once that fluid is in the minor calyx, it's going to be the stuff you see in the toilet. We no longer refer to that fluid as filtrate. We call it urine. So the minor calyces fuse to form the major calyces, or the major calyx singular. The major calyx fuses to form what's called the renal pelvis, which is the centralized region of urine collection in the kidneys. And then that renal pelvis will empty into this muscular tube that transports urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. This muscular tube is referred to as the ureter. Now, when you think about the kidneys, the kidneys account for about 3% of your body. They, they account for a tiny percent of your body mass maybe 3%, but they get more than 25% of blood flow. So more than 25% of the blood flowing through your body at any given point in time is being diverted to the kidneys. And the reason why is because the kidneys filter blood plasma, right? That's what the kidneys actually physically do is they filter blood plasma. So that blood, right, is taken to the kidneys off a branch of the abdominal aorta called the renal artery. From the renal artery, we feed into the segmental arteries, which feed the different segments of the kidney. And from the segmental arteries, you get the interlobar arteries, the interlobar arteries to the arcuate arteries that extend and kind of branch over the renal pyramids. Coming off the arcuate arteries, we then have what are called the interlobular arteries or the cortical paying homage to the cortex where you find them, radiate arteries because they radiate out into the cortex. And it's at these very small blood vessel networks where things start to become interesting in the kidney. So know that kind of blood flow route, and then what we're going to do is we're going to draw a focal point to the cortical radiate or the interlobular artery, and we're going to see the blood vessel networks that come off that that make everything the kidney does possible.
but they are richly perfused with blood. 25%, 20 to 25% of your cardiac output, the amount of blood your heart's moving at any given point in time, right, is being diverted to the kidneys because that filtration uh, process and the modifications uh, that take place in the kidney, that filtered blood, that's really, really important. So when we think about the kidneys, right, you have the renal cortex and then you have the renal medulla. Now, within those, we have these microscopic structures called nephrons that we just kind of looked at. Nephrons are the most important structures in the kidneys, right? The kidneys, if you were to look at them microscopically, they're just bundles of nephrons, right? Anywhere from 800,000 to 1.5 million, depending on the size of the kidney. And these nephrons are where most of the functionality of the kidneys really derive from, right? Meaning the nephrons are the workers in the kidneys. So when we think about the blood vessel network here, we have the arcuate artery that kind of loops up over the renal pyramids. So down here you'd have a renal pyramid and here you have your arcuate artery. The arcuate artery feeds into the interlobular, aka the cortical radiate arteries, because they radiate into the cortex and then branching off of the interlobular slash cortical radiate arteries is what's called the afferent arterial. Remember that arterioles are kind of like small arteries that feed into capillary networks. So this afferent arterial feeds into arguably one of the most important capillary networks in your body. Singularly, they're referred to as the glomerulus. Plurally, they're the glomeruli. And this is where filtration of blood plasma actually happens, is within the glomerulus of the kidney. So... The afferent arterial feeds blood into the glomerulus, and then this smaller arterial called the efferent arterial takes blood out of the glomerulus. You can always distinguish the afferent arterial from the efferent arterial because the afferent arterial has a wider diameter. It's always going to be the larger of the two vessels. It physically has a wider diameter. So if the afferent arterial, which has this wide diameter, is bringing blood to the glomerulus, which is a capillary network where exchange occurs, we're going to talk about that exchange in just a moment, and then draining that capillary network, you have the efferent arterial, which is much smaller. The efferent arterial can't drain blood at the same rate the afferent arterial can bring it into the glomerulus, right? So it slows down a bit, and what that causes is a buildup of pressure in this capillary network. And it's that buildup of hydrostatic pressure that forces fluid across the capillary wall in the process of filtration. And once that fluid exits out of the capillary and enters into this little capsule that marks the beginning of the nephron, this little capsule is called the Bowman's capsule. Once the fluid Right? Once blood plasma gets pushed across the capillary wall or the capillary network that we call the glomerulus, and it enters into the Bowman's capsule of the nephron, that fluid is no longer called blood plasma. It is called filtrate. The process that produces filtrate, right, produces the fluid that enters into the nephron is called filtration. So that's what the kidneys are really doing. Right? They're filtering blood plasma, so these glomeruli are really, really important. Without them, the kidney can't do its job properly. It can't do its job at all, and you die. So the afferent arterial is always bigger than the efferent arterial in order to build up pressure in the glomerulus, which promotes filtration, which is what the glomeruli of the kidneys do. You then have blood coming out of the efferent arterial and entering into different capillary networks. The capillaries surrounding the nephron in the renal cortex are referred to as the paratubular capillaries. There's exchange between the filtrate in the blood all the time, meaning the fluid in the nephron some of that fluid and some of the solutes, in fact, the majority of fluid and solutes are going to be reabsorbed from the nephron back into the blood. But some of that stuff is going to remain in the nephron and it's going to become urine, which we physically get rid of. So along the entirety of the nephron, there's an exchange between the nephron and the blood. 
right? We either reabsorb good stuff like nutrients and water, or we get rid of bad stuff like toxins along the length of the nephron. And we'll talk about that process in just a moment. So the capillaries that exchange with the nephron in the renal cortex are called the paratubular capillaries. The capillaries that exchange with the nephron in the renal medulla are called the vasa recta. Now, the nephron is broken into a series of segments. The initial segment, because it's uh, twisty and turning all over the place, aka convoluted, and it's closest to the point of the origin of the structure, which is really the Bowman's capsule, this initial segment of the nephron is called the proximal convoluted tubule. Filtrate flows through the proximal convoluted tubule to this hairpin loop. The descending portion of this hairpin loop is called the descending limb of the loop of Henle, or the descending loop of Henle. The ascending portion of this loop is called the ascending loop of Henle. So here we have loop of Henle. You have the descending and ascending loops. Don't worry about thick and thin limbs. Then we have our distal convoluted tubule, right? The distal convoluted tubule of many nephrons feeds into a large duct called the collecting duct, large comparatively to the other segments of the nephron. The collecting duct is the final segment of the nephron. If fluid remains in the collecting duct and eventually empties into the minor calyx, it's no longer called filtrate. The moment that that fluid exits the nephron, it's now called urine, and then it enters into those urine collection pathways we just talked about. So, if I gave you an image like this, be able to identify all of the structures, right, that we just talked about. So we have the region here is the renal cortex, the renal medulla. Here we have the arcuate artery, the interlobular, aka the cortical radiate arteries, and notice how the position of the afferent and efferent arterial have swapped. You can always distinguish the afferent arterial from the efferent arterial because it's going to be projecting directly off the interlobular artery, and the afferent arterial is larger than the efferent arterial in order to build up pressure in this most important capillary tuft or capillary network here called the glomerulus. When pressure builds up in the glomerulus, it forces blood plasma across the capillary wall into this space surrounding the capillaries, and the space surrounding the glomerular capillary is called the Bowman's capsule. That's the initial segment of the nephron. So fluid moves into the Bowman's capsule, and then that fluid begins its trip through the nephron. Now, the efferent arterial, right, ultimately feeds into the paratubular capillaries, the capillary networks in the renal cortex are called the paratubular capillaries. The capillary networks in the renal medulla are called the vasa recta. And what's happening along the entire length of the nephron is there's reabsorption and secretion. So we're moving good stuff from the filtrate back into the blood and we're getting rid of bad stuff. So you have the proximal convoluted tubule, the descending loop of Henle, the ascending loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and then ultimately the collecting duct. When urine gets to the end of the, or pardon me, when filtrate gets to the end of the nephron, end of the collecting duct, and it enters into the minor calyx, at that point it transitions from being called filtrate to urine. What urine really is, is filtered blood plasma. That's ultimately where it comes from. So that's why you can tell so many things about the blood by looking at the urine or analyzing the chemical composition of the urine. So there are essentially three processes associated with the formation of urine. Process number one is filtration. So here we have our afferent and efferent arterial. Afferent is always bigger than the efferent to build up pressure in this capillary network called the glomerulus. Excess hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus forces blood plasma across the capillary wall in the process of filtration into what's called the Bowman's capsule, right? Anything that gets pushed across the capillary wall into the Bowman's capsule becomes what's called filtrate, and this process is filtration. In fact, the first process in the formation of urine is filtration, right? So that's process number one that takes place. Now, we produce about 180 liters of filtrate a day, right? An average person produces about 180 liters of filtrate a day. That value is referred to when you have the amount of filtrate produced per unit time, that value is referred to as your glomerular filtration rate. 
Now, we don't do any of the math of the renal system in this introductory class, but there is a mathematics behind how to calculate GFR, and the amount of filtrate, right, the amount of blood plasma that's filtered per unit time, the amount of filtrate that's produced is called your GFR, or your glomerular filtration rate. It is the most important value in determining kidney function. You want a high GFR, right? A high GFR means your kidneys are filtering blood effectively. A low GFR means your kidneys are not filtering blood effectively and you're going to have things like toxins build up in the blood and those are going to cause problems. So we produce about 180 liters of filtrate a day, but we don't urinate 180 liters a day. The reason that we don't urinate 180 liters a day is the overwhelming majority of that filtrate gets reabsorbed back into the bloodstream, right? And that the kidneys are selective about how to do this, depending on the conditions of the body. What gets reabsorbed from the filtrate back into the blood are good things. So salt, like sodium chloride, you don't want to lose those ions. They're important. So we reabsorb salt. We don't do it perfectly. We lose a little, but we reabsorb most of it. The overwhelming majority of water is reabsorbed. Nutrients like glucose and amino acids, vitamins, minerals, anything the body needs gets reabsorbed back fr from the filtrate back into the blood. So the process of filtrate moving back into the blood is called reabsorption. And we reabsorb the things we want in the body, like salt, water, vitamins, minerals, nutrients like glucose and amino acids. But anything we don't want remains within the tubule, and anything that remains in this tubule will ultimately be eliminated in the urine. So we don't want to reabsorb things like toxins, for example. So metabolic byproducts like urea, uric acid, ammonia, they stay in the filtrate. We don't reabsorb them because we're trying to get rid of them. And in fact, when the body is really trying to get rid of stuff, it will move that material from the blood into the filtrate. The movement of substances from the blood into the filtrate is called secretion. And we secrete things we don't want, right? We secrete things the body needs to get rid of, like metabolic toxins, wastes, medications, things that the body deems to be foreign. So that process is called secretion, and anything that's left over at the end of the pipeline gets eliminated in the form of urine. So those are the three processes associated with urine formation. Now, I really like this particular graphic because you see the renal artery bringing unfiltered blood into the kidneys. That unfiltered blood enters into the kidneys and then from the renal artery to the segmental artery to the interlobar arteries to the arcuate arteries to the interlobular arteries, and this is... Uh, the afferent arterial, the glomerulus, and it's at the level of the glomerulus that filtration happens. That filtrate then passes through the nephron, and anything that doesn't get reabsorbed and anything that gets secreted, right, remains in that filtrate and it enters into the minor calyx, the major calyx, our urinary collection pathways. That urine is then collected to the renal pelvis and ultimately taken out the ureter, and this urine is going to be eliminated in the body. So where the ureter is taking the urine is to the urinary bladder, right? And urine is really just filtered blood plasma. So you have unfiltered blood coming into the kidneys, and then you have filtered blood going out of the kidneys. And we filter our blood anywhere from 20 to 40 times a day, right? We filter our blood plasma all the time. So when somebody goes and they do dialysis, they're actually put on a machine that artificially filters blood plasma. It takes hours, and they only get it like once or twice. It's nowhere near as good as what the kidneys are doing all day, every day. So you have that unfiltered blood coming into the kidneys, right? Anything that our body wants to get rid of, we eliminate in the form of urine. And then... What you see coming out of here is filtered blood that has a lower, for example, count of metabolic waste and toxins or lower concentration of metabolic waste and toxins. So when you think about what's happening at the level of the glomerulus, if we were to zoom in right to this point out here in the cortex of the kidney, 
You have this afferent arterial, which branches off the inner lobular, aka cortical radiate arteries, and it enters into the glomerulus. The glomerulus is the capillary network that facilitates filtration. Now, big things like red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and proteins, they're too big to fit across the capillary wall. So they remain in the blood. They don't ever get filtered. But water and small water-soluble solutes like ions, you know, electrolytes, glucose, amino acids, those things get toxins like urea, uric acid, ammonia. Those things get pushed across the capillary wall into this area called the Bowman space. The moment that plasma is pushed across the capillary wall into this Bowman's capsule or Bowman space, once it enters into that, it's no longer called blood plasma, it's called filtrate, and the process that produces filtrate right in the glomerulus of the kidney is called filtration. So you could make an argument that the glomerulus is the most important structure in the kidney because it facilitates that initial process in the formation of urine, which is filtration. And in doing that, all of the other functions of the kidney, the regulation of electrolyte balance, well, it does that by reabsorbing electrolytes from the filtrate, right? Or eliminating electrolytes in the form of urine. How does it regulate blood volume? If blood volume is low, we reabsorb more water. If blood volume is high, we get rid of water, right? And in doing that, we regulate blood pressure. We can get rid of things like hydrogen ions to bring the pH back up if pH drops too low. So all of that stems from this initial process, which is filtration. You have your afferent arterial and then your efferent arterial, and we've discussed the afferent arterial is always going to be thicker than the efferent arterial to build up pressure in the glomerulus, which is where filtration occurs. It's that hydrostatic pressure that actually uh, promotes filtration. So when you look here, here we have our afferent arterial, here we have our efferent arterial, and here is the capillary network of the glomerulus. What gets pushed across are water and small water-soluble solutes. Now, small water-soluble solutes that the body needs, like electrolytes, glucose, and amino acids, they get reabsorbed from the filtrate back into the bloodstream because we need those things. You would urinate yourself to death in like 17 minutes if we didn't reabsorb the overwhelming majority of what was produced as filtrate, right? Literally, you would urinate yourself to death, and that's possible. You can. In fact, diabetes is just a condition of urination, and we don't have enough time to talk about that in detail, but you can. So we reabsorb good stuff. We reabsorb the stuff that we need, right? And reabsorption is the movement of substances from the filtrate back into the blood. Then some stuff, like metabolic toxins and wastes, like urea, uric acid, ammonia, creatinine, right? These things we want to get rid of, uh, medications, compounds, toxins, they don't get reabsorbed. They just remain in the filtrate, and anything that remains in the filtrate will eventually become urine, and we'll get rid of it. And in addition to that, in addition to not reabsorbing stuff that the body doesn't need, like toxins, you also secrete that stuff in from the blood into the renal tubule to get rid of it. Because anything that enters into the nephron, aka the renal tubule, and remains in there until the point that it becomes urine is going to be eliminated from the body. So we don't reabsorb everything. We reabsorb the stuff we need, and we don't reabsorb the stuff we don't right? So when you think about the three processes associated with the formation of urine, filtration, reabsorption, secretion, we filter everything, right? So, you, you know, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, proteins, they're too big to get filtered across that membrane. But everything else, like the uh, water in the plasma and the small water soluble solutes get filtered across. So good and bad stuff. That's what I mean by everything gets filtered across and it becomes filtrate. Now the overwhelming majority of that filtrate is good. So we reabsorb it. We reabsorb uh, most of the water, most of the salt, all of the sugar in a healthy kidney, all of the amino acids in a healthy kidney. And anything that's left over, right, that we want to get rid of from the blood, we secrete those substances into the renal tubule where they'll ultimately be eliminated in the urine. Now, if you ever do like a, uh, a blood test or a chem panel, 
and you see GFR, that stands for glomerular filtration rate. And glomerular filtration rate is just the rate at which the kidneys are creating filtrate per unit time. You could do it in filtrate per day, which is about 180 liters, or you could do it in the amount of filtrate in milliliters per minute. So you produce, right, a healthy kidney produces around 120 milliliters per minute of filtrate, right? Over the course of a day, about 180 liters. The reason we don't urinate that quantity or that volume is because we reabsorb most of it. Now, if glomerular filtration rate is high, it means your kidneys are working well and you're getting rid of toxins and the kidneys are managing all of those different functional tasks like regulating blood pressure, blood volume, right, uh, pH, etc. When glomer glomerular filtration drops, it means the kidneys are not doing well. And what's going to happen is if the kidneys are not filtering very effectively is GFR is going to drop. And when GFR goes down, the concentration of toxins and metabolic byproducts in your blood goes up. Your ability to regulate blood pressure becomes skewed. Your ability to regulate ion composition gets disrupted. Right? So all these consequences, but really think of it as GFR drops, toxins start to build up in the blood. And if GFR tops too, drops too low and you can't filter anything out, right, then you're in acute kidney failure and you are on a transplant list and you're undergoing dialysis. So this number, especially if you ever take AMP2, becomes really important. And believe it or not, the urinary system is the most mathematically dense system that we have in physiology if you take AMP2 at ACC. It's, there's a lot of math behind what we're looking at. We're just simplifying it because this is the intro class. So normal and abnormal constituents of urine. Normal urinary constituents means things you should find in the urine. So ions. Even though we reabsorb the overwhelming majority of electrolytes in the filtrate, some of them still manage to get lost in the urine and we have to replace them in our diet. So it's totally normal to find things like sodium and uh, magnesium, potassium, calcium, chloride. Those are normal constituents of urine. Creatinine. This is the byproduct of skeletal muscle contraction, right? and we ultimately filter it out and eliminate it in our urine, this is actually the marker as to whether urine, if urine is real or not. So for example, if you're trying to deceive a urinalysis, right, for maybe looking for the metabolite of a drug or an illicit substance, what they're looking at, what the clinical exam is looking at to determine if that urine is real or not is creatinine, right? It's physically looking at creatinine. And that's the byproduct of skeletal muscle contraction, so everybody should have that in their blood. It's also the marker, the concentration of creatinine, as to whether you're trying to dilute out your sample. So if you're drinking a ton of water in order to try and intentionally deceive a urinalysis test, what they're going to do is it's going to come back as what's called dilute, which arguably is better for you, but I won't get into that too much. And what they're looking at to see whether it's dilute is creatinine. Urea is the byproduct of the breakdown of proteins, as is ammonia. Uric acid is the byproduct of the breakdown of nucleic acids. And uric acid is if you leave urine in the toilet for too long, you see like uh, urine rings start to build. Those urine rings are largely made of uric acid. Uric acid is also one of those things that if you get really dehydrated, the concentrations of uric acid in the body go up and they start to crystallize in the kidney and they can form things like kidney stones. So these are totally normal to find in the urine. You should find those in the urine. Things that you shouldn't find in the urine or abnormal constituents of urine are things like glucose. Even though glucose gets filtered in a healthy kidney, you should reabsorb every last speck of glucose. If you find glucose in the urine, it means that there are abnormally high glucose concentrations in the blood. And if the concentrations of, a concentration of glucose in the blood is abnormally high, so high that it's spilling over into the urine essentially, right, because we can't reabsorb all that's getting filtered, then that could be indicative of a metabolic condition like diabetes, diabetes mellitus. So, Finding glucose in the urine is really common and uh, can reflect conditions like diabetes.
Ketone bodies. Now, ketone bodies can sometimes be found in the urine. Ketone bodies are the byproduct of the breakdown of fat. So, for example, if you're intentionally trying to lose weight and you're dieting and exercising and you find ketone bodies in your urine, that's normal, right? But if you find both ketone bodies and glucose, meaning you have plenty of glucose in your blood, but your body can't use it, so it's using fat instead, which is a hallmark characteristic of diabetes, both glucose and ketone bodies are 100% reflective of diabetes. You have a diagnosis of diabetes beyond a shadow of a doubt there. Ketone bodies, when they build up to, when the, they're found in the, the concentrations get too high, they're really acidic. So they can produce a condition called diabetic ketoacidosis, and you can actually physically um, smell that on somebody's breath. You can actually physically smell that on somebody's breath. Proteins. Proteins should never be found in the urine, right? So they should be too big to get across the glomerular capillary wall, right? They should remain in the blood. If proteins are getting filtered into the urine, if you find proteins in the urine, a really common cause of finding proteins in the urine is, one, blood pressure is really too high. It's reflective of what's called hypertension. So blood pressure might be really high. So finding proteins in the urine can reflect things like hypertension. Uh, it can also reflect things like bacterial infections in the kidney, et cetera, but focus on hypertension for this exam. Red blood cells should never find red blood cells in the urine. When you find red blood cells in the urine, that's called hematuria, right? You're bleeding into the urine and you don't want to be urinating out red blood cells. That could be damage in the kidneys. It could be a kidney stone. It could be a bladder stone. Lots of different reasons you'll find blood in the urine, but you don't ever want to. Now, white blood cells should never be found in the urine. If they are, right, that could be reflective of an infection in the urinary tract. Nitrites are the byproduct of bacterial metabolism. So if you find both white blood cells and nitrites, that is 100% indicative of a urinary tract infection. White blood cells by themselves, not necessarily. Both white blood cells and nitrites, 100% indicative of a urinary tract infection. So what we were doing in lab this week is we are going to urinate into a cup and we're going to use what are called urine dipsticks to evaluate our urine for normal and abnormal constituents. When you take a urine dipstick, it's called a dipstick because you put it in the urine for a very short period of time where you dip it. So you dip it into the urine, then you take it out, and you compare the dipstick to what's called the legend, right? Meaning, how do you interpret the test result? Now, the dipstick itself is going to have a series of um, strips on it. And these strips, what the bottom one is going to be glucose, bilirubin, ketone bodies, etc. Now, if none of these turn a different color, it means that, you know, the, those are fine. If they do turn a different color, it means that that particular compound is in the urine, which could be reflective of some kind of disease or could be clinically relevant. So on an exam, I'm going to give you something like this right? And then I am going to give you a dipstick. I want to highlight that when I give you a urine dipstick, the very bottom, right, that very bottom strip, which is white, is nothing. So start at the blue when you're looking and you're comparing it to your, um, the, the way that you evaluate the test, right? The, the um, key or the legend. So you have your dipstick. At the bottom, we have glucose. Glucose should turn in 30 seconds if there's glucose present and so on and so forth up to 120 seconds. This test is performed in two minutes. It's a real quick lab. So we have glucose. If glucose turns, meaning that you put your dipstick in and glucose turns a different color than its original color, what that's reflective of is glucose in the urine. If there's glucose in the urine, that's strongly indicative of a metabolic condition like diabetes. It means that there's really high concentrations of glucose in the blood, and we can't even reabsorb all of it that enters into the filtrate. In a healthy kidney, you should reabsorb every last speck of glucose. There should be none in the, in the urine. Bilirubin. 
Billy Rubin is a byproduct essentially of the breakdown of red blood cells and Billy Rubin should be eliminated by the liver. If Billy Rubin is building up in the blood and the kidneys have to get rid of it, it could be indicative of a liver problem of some kind, right? Ketone bodies. Now we talked about ketone bodies. They are the byproduct of the breakdown of fat. If you are trying to lose weight and you see ketone bodies in your urine without glucose, that's totally normal. But if you see both glucose and ketone bodies in the urine, meaning that you have plenty of glucose in your blood but your body's not using it, it's using fat, that is 100% indicative of diabetes, 100% diagnostic, right? So don't worry about that. Specific gravity is a measure of the concentration, essentially, of urine. Now, it's the density of urine comparative to water, but it's concentration. The higher the specific gravity, the more concentrated the urine is. A high specific gravity is typically reflective of dehydration, right? So as that number gets higher, a person's urine is probably darker yellow and more concentrated. And what that really means, right, in most cases, it's reflective of dehydration. That's the most common cause. We have blood. We've talked about that. pH. Now, urinary pH ranges from like 4 to 8.5. People with more alkaline urine tend to be like um, vegetarians. A lot of leafy greens and vegetables metabolize alkaline and they produce, uh, you can uh, shift the pH of your urine to be more alkaline. People who have a lot of protein in their diet, notably like meats, tend to have more acidic pH. Protein in the urine, the protein you find in the urine is typically what's called albumin. It's one of our little plasma proteins. It's the smallest of the plasma proteins and it maintains that thing called blood colloid osmotic pressure that we were talking about, right, in a previous lecture. And if you find protein in the urine, it could be reflective of a wide range of things, but the most common reason to find protein in the urine is hypertension meaning high blood pressure. You're physically popping those proteins from the blood into the filtrate because the blood pressure is elevated, so it's physically forcing them across. Urobilogen, it's normal to find a little bit of urobilogen in the urine. It's actually what gives urine its color, its yellow coloration that we associate with it. It is also a byproduct of the breakdown of red blood cells, but if you have a lot of urobilogen in your liver, or pardon me, urobilogen in your urine, it could be reflective of the fact that you're breaking down red blood cells too quickly and you could have some kind of like anemic disorder. Now, leukocytes are white blood cells and nitrites are the, the uh, metabolic byproduct of the metabolism of E. coli. So if you find, if both leukocytes and nitrites turn, so if both leukocytes and nitrites turn, right, or react, it is 100% indicative of a urinary tract infection. So the filtration membrane, we're just going to focus on this for a little bit. You have the afferent arterial, the efferent arterial, and the glomerulus. Blood flows into the glomerulus through the afferent arterial, right? At the level of the glomerulus, blood is forced across the capillary wall, and it's forced across something called the filtration membrane. The filtration membrane consists of the endothelial cells of the capillary wall, the basement membrane, and these little things called filtration slits that are produced by these cells that drape over the glomerulus called podocytes. So there are three layers to the filtration membrane wall, so only small water-soluble things are going to get across that filtration membrane in a healthy kidney. So the glomerulus pushes, right, a little bit of excess hydrostatic pressure, pushes plasma across the glomerular capillary wall through the filtration membrane. When it enters into the Bowman's capsule, it is now called filtrate. That filtrate then enters into the different segments of the nephron where most of it is reabsorbed, right? Some of it isn't, and some stuff is put into it, and then we eliminate it in the form of urine. But remember, we, re we reabsorb most of it because most of it is good but you have to filter out everything, right? All of those small water-soluble compounds to figure out what we want to keep and what we want to get rid of. It's the most effective way to do that. Then you have your efferent arterial. Afferent arterial is always going to be larger than the efferent arterial in order to build up pressure in the glomerulus, which promotes filtration. Now, this part right here is the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, and there's a group of cells that actually 
are in close contact with the blood vessel networks that feed into the Bowman's capsule. And these group of cells are called the mac macula densa cells. And the cells that they communicate are called the juxtaglomerular cells. If I was to put a box around this whole thing, it's called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So next to the glomerulus, it's the little piece of machinery next to the glomerulus. And the juxtaglomerular apparatus, even though we don't have a ton of time or pretty much any to talk about the mechanisms there in an intro class, but the juxtaglomerular apparatus, or JGA does, is it regulates blood pressure. So if you were to look at a histological image, what you are looking at right here is the glomerulus. What you are looking at right here is the Bowman's capsule. The fluid in the glomerulus is blood. Blood has blood plasma. The moment that plasma gets pushed across the capillary wall into the surrounding Bowman's capsule, it's no longer called blood plasma. It is called filtrate. The process that filtrate is produced is called filtration. So those are my focal points here. Now, when you have the Bowman's capsule, if I was to put a bracket around this whole thing, when you have both the Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus, that's called a renal corpuscle. And the only place you'll ever find renal corpuscles, we were looking at a renal corpuscle there, but the only place you'll ever find renal corpuscles is within the renal cortex. So you know that that histological image had to be taken from the renal cortex because you can see a renal corpuscle. Now, when you think about the glomerulus, right? This is a capillary network that facilitates filtration of the blood plasma. It does that by blood plasma getting pushed across this filtration membrane, the capillary wall, into the Bowman's capsule, and that process is called filtration. So big things don't get across, small water-soluble things and water do, and then that's the fluid that actually enters into the different segments of the nephron. Now when you think about the filtration membrane, the filtration membrane is made up of essentially three layers. And what we're looking at here is a tunneling electron microscope image at a magnification of 78,000. At this magnification, a red blood cell would be like as big as this page, probably a little bit bigger, right? So if a red blood cell is like as big as this page and a white blood cell is even bigger and a protein is like as big as this little circle I'm drawing here, they're not going to be able to fit across these little fenestrations within the capillary wall because they're just too big. The only thing that's going to get across that is small water-soluble compounds. So you have filtration occurs. It crosses the fenestrated capillary wall. And remember, fenestrated capillaries have little holes in them. Then it crosses across a negatively charged basal lamina. That negatively charged basal lamina repels proteins, so that's an extra mechanism to prevent proteins being found in the urine. And finally, these are the feet of those podocytes that we were talking about, and they form little slits called filtration slits. And once blood plasma moves across all three of those layers into the surrounding Bowman's capsule, it's no longer called blood plasma, it's called filtrate. The process by which plasma right, is converted to filtrate within the glomerular capillary of the kidneys is called filtration. Right? So what we're looking at here is the filtration membrane. Now, the reason that you don't find big items is they're physically just too big to fit across those little gaps. But Albumins, let's pretend an albumin protein is about as big as what I'm indicating right there. If blood pressure increases, you can actually just pop those albumin proteins across the capillary wall. And when you pop them across the capillary wall, right, you can actually just, through the force of that increased blood pressure, you can force those proteins across. And that's why people who are hypertensive can uh, have proteins found in their urine. And if you look at that urine, right? Because you evaluate urine for things like turbidity. You actually look at it. You even sometimes smell it, right? To smell if it's like sweet or rancid. You look at it, the urine of somebody who has a high concentration of proteins in it will look like frothy. So 
Here we have the glomerulus, and within your kidneys, you have many, many millions of glomeruli. And here we have the afferent arterial, the efferent arterial, and then here are our, here is the glomerulus, and then here is the Bowman's capsule, and these are the different segments of the nephron. Now remember, this isn't an AMP2 class, so we're not going to go into a tremendous amount of detail over the nephron. We are just going to talk about the basic functions of each of the different segments of the nephron. So here, by the way, we have the capillary network of the vasorecta. So the numbers that you're looking at right here indicate concentration. So it's a unit of concentration called milliosmolarity. Bottom line, the higher the number, the more concentrated the fluid is, in this case, filtrate. So let's look at what happens as filtrate passes through the nephron. You have the glomerulus, right? This is where filtration occurs. Blood plasma gets pushed across the filtration membrane and it enters into the glomerular, or it, pardon me, into the Bowman's capsule, aka the glomerular capsule, but we'll call it the Bowman's capsule. The moment that that blood plasma gets pushed across the capillary wall into this Bowman's capsule, it's no longer called blood plasma, it is called filtrate. That filtrate then enters into the different segments of the nephron. The first segment of the nephron is called the proximal convoluted tubule. Now, on your little sheet, right, in the handout, I would actually label your proximal convoluted tubule. And then when you're wanting to know the function of the proximal convoluted tubule, this is where the overwhelming majority of salt and water and all nutrient reabsorption takes place. So all glucose and amino acids are reabsorbed at the level of the proximal convoluted tubule. So about 60 to 70 percent of salt and water reabsorption take place in the proximal convoluted tubule and all nutrient reabsorption, notably glucose and amino acids, are reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. Then as that filtrate works its way through the nephron, it enters into what's called the descending loop of Henle. The descending loop of Henle reabsorbs water and only water. I'll say that again. The descending loop of Henle reabsorbs water and only water. If the descending loop of Henle is reabsorbing water and only water, it means that you're removing water from the filtrate, but you're keeping solutes in it. So there's going to be a higher ratio of solute to water, so the concentration of the filtrate in the descending loop of Henle gets progressively more concentrated because the descending loop of Henle is reabsorbing water and only water. The loop of Henle is essentially an adaptation to life on land. The longer the loop of Henle, the more water you can reabsorb, the more water you can reabsorb, right? The less prone you are to things like dehydration when you don't have an immediately read or a readily available water source. So you have the descending loop of Henle in which the nephron reabsorbs water and only water. In the ascending loop of Henle, and we don't talk about countercurrent exchange mechanisms because this is just a survey course, it's the intro course, so sometimes it's difficult for me to simplify this down to the level uh, we need in this class, but it's only fair because you guys have a ton to cover in one semester. We cover every system, we just don't go very deep. But in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, you get the reabsorption of salt and only salt. So as the filtrate moves up the ascending limb of the loop of Henle and we're reabsorbing salt and only salt, you'll notice that the filtrate is becoming more and more dilute. Now in the distal convoluted tubule, you get a little bit of reabsorption and secretion, and then that filtrate will enter into the collecting duct. Now the collecting duct is interesting because it's not always absorbing water. It only absorbs water when we need to reabsorb water, right? Otherwise that filtrate just exits out of the collecting duct and becomes urine. So I'm going to elaborate on that in just a little bit, but make sure to write those things down that we talked about. Most secretion also takes place in the proximal convoluted tubule. So when you look at an image like this, here we're looking at the plasma concentration of antidiuretic hormone. As we know, I'm sure, antidiuretic hormone is released by the posterior pituitary gland in response to dehydration. So 
The hypothalamus detects that dehydration and it tells the posterior pituitary to release a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. It can also be called arginine vasopressin or ABP. And what that antidiuretic hormone does is it travels to the collecting duct of the kidney and it binds to receptors in the collecting duct of the kidney where it triggers the reabsorption of water. So let's look at this graph and tie it to these two images right here and we'll see what we can tell about these two images just based on this graph, right? Plasma osmolarity, right, is talking about the concentration of your blood plasma. If you become dehydrated, you are going to lose more water than solute and the concentration of your blood plasma is going to increase. God, that's an annoying feature. The concentration of your blood plasma is going to increase. As the concentration of your blood plasma increases, that increased concentration is detected by these cells in the hypothalamus called osmoreceptors, right? And they go, ooh, we're dehydrated. So they initiate a couple of different pathways. They initiate a behavioral pathway associated with thirst. So if you're thirsty, you're probably dehydrated already because the concentration of your blood plasma has increased to the point that it's activated that mechanism in the hypothalamus. The other thing that the hypothalamus is going to do is it's going to tell the posterior pituitary gland to produce antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone is going to travel to the collecting duct of the kidney, bind to receptors, and trigger those cells to start reabsorbing water and only water, right? So we reabsorb water. Now, if you're reabsorbing water, that means there's going to be less filtrate, so you're going to produce a smaller quantity of urine. So you can tell a few things about a person who's reabsorbing water along the collecting duct. One of the things you can tell about that person is, number one, they're dehydrated. Because only if you're dehydrated and if antidiuretic hormone is present are you going to be reabsorbing water along the collecting duct. Right? So you know if you're reabsorbing water along the collecting duct, that person is dehydrated. They have antidiuretic hormone in their blood. Right? They're going to produce a small volume of very concentrated urine, and that makes a lot of sense. If you've ever urinated when you've been dehydrated, you're not urinating as frequently or as much, and you urinate smaller volumes of really concentrated kind of dark yellow-brown urine. On the flip token, if somebody is well hydrated and their blood plasma concentration is low, you can get... No antidiuretic hormone being released, essentially, and in the absence of antidiuretic hormone, you're not going to reabsorb water along the collecting duct. If you're not reabsorbing water along the collecting duct, you're going to produce a large volume of very dilute urine. So if somebody's not reabsorbing water along the collecting duct of the kidney, what that could actually indicate, right, is that they are well hydrated, that antidiuretic hormone isn't present in the system, and they're going to be producing large volumes of dilute urine, right? So we have the filtrate moving through here, and the collecting duct's right function changes depending on the status of the body, whether you're dehydrated or not. Now, there are some medications that cause what's called the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. Particularly notorious culprits in that are antipsychotics and antidepressants. So antidepressants even it could, in a very small percentage of people, produce a situation in which the hypothalamus is no longer regulating blood concentration very effectively. So you don't get the release of antidiuretic hormone. When antidiuretic hormone levels are very low, right, you could start urinating out essentially your blood volume. So you'll start urinating more whether you're dehydrated or well hydrated. And in that urine, you're going to be getting rid of things like electrolytes. And it can actually not only drop your blood volume, so not releasing antidiuretic hormone because you want to be able to reabsorb water. We have a lot of it flowing through the kidneys. Not releasing antidiuretic hormone, you're going to start urinating out your water. It's going to produce dehydration, 
It's also going to shift your electrolyte balance because you're going to start urinating out electrolytes like sodium and potassium and it's going to throw your electrolyte concentrations off and it's those electrolyte concentrations that get thrown off when people go into the the doctor and they have, you know, the the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion and they're discombobulated, their level of consciousness has changed, right? It's because those neurons don't have those electrolytes that they need to fire action potentials. So that's actually quite a serious consequence of some of those medications, those psychotropic medications. Now, the renal regulation of pH essentially boils down to one thing. Anything in the tubular lumen is going to become urine. Anything in the blood is going to remain in the blood. The way that the kidneys regulate pH is if we... If the pH in the blood is too low, meaning we have too many hydrogen ions floating around, they just secrete hydrogen ions and they get rid of them in the urine, right? That it literally just moves hydrogen ions from the blood into the filtrate, which eventually becomes the urine. If pH is too low, or pardon me, pardon me, if pH is too high, right, we start secreting bicarbonate ions and reabsorbing hydrogen. It's just the movement of hydrogen ions. And how would you move it? Would you want to get rid of or would you want to keep hydrogen ions? Now, the muscular tubes that transport urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder are called the ureters. The ureters bring that urine to the urinary bladder and they enter via what are called the urethral openings. The ureters are these muscular tubes that if you look at a cross section of them, it kind of looks like a star. And the type of epithelial tissue that lines both the ureters and the urinary bladder is transitional epithelium. And transitional epithelium is really useful in those areas because it's capable of stretching, right? And the ureters and the urinary bladder have to accommodate for fluid fluctuations, so they need to be able to stretch. So you have the urethral openings, and then you have the urethral opening. The urinary bladder is lined by transitional epithelium. It's also lined by a layer of smooth muscle. This smooth muscle that lines the urinary bladder is called the detrusor muscle. So right now my detrusor muscle is relaxed, right? Because I'm not urinating. But the moment I get done with this uh, online lecture that I'm giving you, which I'm super excited about, I am going to be contracting my detrusor muscle right? Because I'm going to be forcing urine out of this opening, which is the urethra. So the muscle that lines the urinary bladder is called the detrusor muscle. And the urethral openings with the urethral opening form a region called the trigone. The trigone is really important because when you're running a catheter, you essentially insert the balloon in the trigone. It's also the area that's most likely to develop a uh, bladder infection as a consequence of that. So you talk about that in your programs. Now, the urethra is a muscular tube that transmits urine from the bladder to the external environment. Now, in women, they, women have a much shorter urethra than men do. They have a urethra that consists of a single segment, right? Much shorter. And that's one of the reasons that women are more prone to things like urinary tract infections because they have this really, really short urethra. It's easier for bacteria to go in and colonize different areas further up the urinary tract. Now, regulating the movement out of the urethra, there's the internal urethral sphincter, which is made of smooth muscle, and it's considered involuntary, right? Meaning that it, if enough pressure builds up, it's just going to relax to allow you to urinate. The external urethral sphincter is made of skeletal muscle. And remember, skeletal muscle is under voluntary control. So that's really good. Because if you had damage to the nerve that fed in, for example, to the external urethral sphincter, you wouldn't be able to regulate the movement of urine out of your body, and that would make you urinary incontinent. So, when you look at the cross-section of the female anatomy, you have the uterus. The uterus is also called the womb, and it rests right on top of the urinary bladder. Lucky for you ladies, especially when you're pregnant. As a consequence of that, the urinary bladder in women tends to be a bit smaller than the urinary bladder in men. Here we have the detrusor muscle, the transitional epithelium. Then you have the um, lumen of the urinary bladder where urine is stored until it's ready to be released out of the urethra. 
And here is your external urethral sphincter. It is a completely separate opening than the vaginal opening. The vaginal canal does not have skeletal muscle or smooth muscle regulating its opening. So if things like menstrual fluid are coming out of the vaginal canal, there's nothing to stop them. And that's why you have to wear things like a tampon or, you know, protect from uh, menstrual flow, right? Because there's nothing to prevent the, mo the movement. You can't like clamp a muscle down like you can with the bladder. Again, these are two separate openings. And because of that, it can actually make running a catheter on a female more challenging in some respects than a male because it can be easy to confuse those two openings. It can actually, if you're doing it and, you know, let's say somebody's a little overweight and you're trying to run that catheter. Um, and again, not a big thing. I'm just kind of mentioning that. In the male, you have the urinary bladder in the pelvic cavity. Now... The urinary bladder, detrusor muscle, transitional epithelium, tends to be a bit bigger because it doesn't have a uterus weighing down on it. And it empties urine into the urethra, but the urethra of males is much longer than the urethra of females. And as a consequence of that, or as an artifact of that, they are men are less likely to develop things like urinary tract infections because it's more difficult to colonize the, for the bacteria to colonize. Also, the proximity of the urethral opening and the anus, which is where most urinary tract infections, which are very different from sexually transmitted infections, right, is further away. It's more protected. So, you have the initial segment of the urethra called the prosthetic urethra, and it passes through this little devil gland right here called the prostate gland. As you get older, as men get older, the prostate gland gets bigger and it clamps down on the urethra, making it a little bit harder to urinate. And everybody, every male in this class will one day feel that pain. So I hope you remember me when you do. I call it the little devil gland or the little bastard gland. Then you have the membranous urethra. And then finally, the longest segment of the urethra that passes through the spongy tissue of the penis is called the spongy urethra. And that's what you have to know for this class about the urinary system.